occurring in L. Um, so just to reiterate quickly, since I'm just beginning to record this, this unit is on increasing operational efficiencies through a practice that in industry we call line balancing. The first several slides are very basic slides to kind of make you understand the generic concept of line balancing and how we can increase efficiency by just being cognizant of some very fundamental line balancing approaches. As we move through the unit, towards the end of the unit, we're going to look at an elaborate mechanism that can be used for creating a line balance. And it is a methodology that is called uh, RPW. And um, we'll see what that is when we get to it. But for the moment, let us begin by looking at some of the basic concepts relating to line balancing. And I'm going to introduce this notion by discussing why assembly lines are used to begin with. And we, we've said that in some cases there, they make a lot of sense. In some cases, maybe we want to back away from them. Let's talk about why we want to use an assembly line. A manufacturing process line. It doesn't have to be an assembly line. It should just be a processing line. Here's a very uh, basic notion here. Let's consider some operations. Hypothetically, we're putting together a rough mock-up of a car. And all we're going to do is put an engine block into place, we're going to put the hood onto the, the car, and we're going to put on the wheels. Just three basic operations. Now, traditionally, the way this would be done is that each assembly must be performed in a sequential manner in the specified order. And each operation is performed independently and sequentially. That means you got to put your engine in place. When that is complete, you move and you put on the hood. And when that is complete, you put on the wheels and then you start again. One, step one, step two, step three. And then you move and then you do it again. So that would be the traditional approach. We are given some uh, times here. With the traditional approach, we're saying only one car would be assembled at a time. And the operation times are given to us. These are sequential. It takes 20 minutes to install the engine. It takes five minutes to place the hood, and it takes 10 minutes to put on the wheels. Again, these are just hypothetical numbers. If we use this traditional approach, our total manufacturing cycle time from the time we begin with operation number one, installing the, the, the engine, 20 minutes, then we install the hood, five minutes, then we installed the wheels, 10 minutes, gives us a total manufacturing cycle time of 35 minutes. And clearly that would give us a certain capacity. So roughly two cars per hour. If we look at taking a slightly different approach here, 
and look at the assembly line approach, where it is possible that operations are split between several stations that are working in parallel, or they can be working simultaneously. In other words, when one operation is complete, the vehicle automatically advances to the next, so the next operator be, works, and so does the first operator. They're working in parallel. And they work in parallel with the third operation or operator. So they're not waiting necessarily for the first job to be complete before the next one starts. So that's what this point says. By having three stations connected by some kind of a conveying system, a total of three cars can be operated on at the same time in parallel. I'll skip this slide. You can read it, read it on your own. If that is the case, if they're all working in parallel, then the total manufacturing cycle time is not no longer you know 20 plus 5 plus 10 but it is as we saw earlier we have a a line with three operations on it and the first one takes 20 minutes i don't remember but the second one takes five the third one takes 10 then the cycle time of this line is de determined by the constraint operation, which is this one, the one that takes the longest. So just by doing this, we've converted our total manufacturing cycle time from reduced it from 35 to 20. And that has just given us a productivity improvement of about 43 percent so this is what we the traditional approach so you you know this job is done complete then you do this job complete then you do this job complete and it takes me 35 minutes when i take that and i break it up into the form of an assembly line as we just saw, this is our constraint operation, determines the cycle time of the line, the capacity of the line, and again, this is our improvement. Let's go a little bit deeper here. So here we have our what we call our constraint operation, TCOM. This is limiting us. It, allow, it limits us to only being able to build one car every 20 minutes. So if we just think about this for a moment, what can we do to improve the area? Well, so here's what we have right now. If I ask you for some of your observations here, um, you can think, take a moment to think about it. And I ask, what observations can you make from the above? And I put here some of the things that came to my mind right, right away. First of all, I said, we have imbalanced cycle times for the stations, number one. So I see this is takes 20 minutes, this takes five minutes, this takes 10 minutes. These are imbalanced station cycle times. Very much like the scenario I created for you in project number one. I gave you a scenario which makes no sense. Number two, I say here, because of the imbalanced station cycle times, we have a lot of idle station time. So this guy is basically waiting here 15 minutes. 
That's called idle time, waiting for this guy to be complete. That's the worst case scenario. This guy is sitting around for 10 minutes. And not only that, because this guy takes 10 and this guy does five, there's gonna be some inventory built up in here. And here, this can create a big bottleneck because if he makes some, if there's some kind of a problem here, this guy's gonna be waiting even longer. So a lot of inefficiency. So I said, there's a lot of wait times. There's a lot of inefficiencies. There's all kinds of waste going on here. So what we want to take out of this really is that we're not going to look at it this in a negative way. We're just going to say there's lots of opportunity for improvement here. How can we go to our manager and suggest ways to improve this? And that's where we begin with this idea or concept of line balancing. Now, let me assure you, there are a lot of experts that go around and do this kind of work. Engineers specialize in this type of work because it results in saving literally millions and millions of dollars to companies. But again, oftentimes an engineer does not go out and work on his own. He, he needs technicians, he needs technologists, he needs a team to work with. And that's where you come in. So what you want to get out of this is, is a conceptual understanding of what is going on. So when you are presented or you find yourself in a, this type of a situation, you know what you're expecting, you know what you're walking into, and you can talk somewhat intelligently about being willing to participate in this type of an undertaking, or maybe being selected to be on a team that can take on this type of work. Again, it's what sets you apart or gives you the edge from someone else. So let's first of all discuss this concept of line balancing. What is it? It's a methodology which results in the improvement of assembly line throughput. At the same time, reducing manpower requirements and costs. What employer does not want that? The main concern, or the main goal, I should say, is to balance the assembly line so that no workstation becomes the bottleneck. What does that mean, no workstation becomes the bottleneck? Think about that for a moment. If there is no bottleneck, that means that all the station cycle times should be the same. So the goal here is the cycle time of every operation should be the same. If, the, if every operation has the same cycle time, just Envision how smooth the operation would flow. Nobody has to wait for anyone. Nobody has any idle time. There is no need for any work in process inventory because when one unit is complete at station A, it automatically moves to station B. And that person is ready to work on, station, on, on the part. And it's all moved sequentially at the, with the same time. So there are no if losses in efficiency. The process, the methodology, involves assigning tasks 
this is important, two workstations in such a way that the time taken at each station is approximately the same. So we have to go into our all the tasks that have to be performed and assign them in such a way that the time taken at the stations is approximately the same. Remember, the goal is to make them all the same. But that's an ideal goal. So this is the theoretical kind of uh, description of what line balancing is. It's an optimization problem of significant industrial importance. The efficiency difference between an optimal and a suboptimal system yields economies or waste that can reach millions of dollars per year for companies. So we're talking big money. So why do we balance? Well, we want to optimize the number of workstations. We want to optimize our manufacturing cycle time. We want to optimize, or actually, I'm sorry, minimize. What am I saying? Let me back up. We want to minimize number of workstations. We want to minimize our manufacturing cycle time. We want to minimize the amount of inventory that's in our system. Remember, inventory is money. We want to minimize the utter idle time that we see in our operations. And we want to minimize the assembly costs. When I say assembly costs, I'm talking about all the sectors involved with the assembly. It could be testing, it could be assembly, any of the above. And we try to optimize productivity. We want to increase productivity. We want to make sure that we have synchronous flow. So everything indexes nicely and moves nicely from one station to the next. And we have want to increase what we call the smoothness of the workflow. We're going to look at this when I show you the methodology that we're going to use, and we're going to calculate what we call the smoothness index of our system. So right now, we don't know what this is, but let's just put it here to BD for later. So let's go back to our very basic example here and revisit this assembly to the of the car assembly line here. And what do we mean by balancing this line? Well, remember, you don't necessarily have to change the time, but if I could change the time of the engine assembly from 20 to 10, then my line would be look like this. Let's say I did something magically that would change this process and it would make it 10. And this next station was five and the next station was 10. Well, I just increased my throughput by 50% if I were able to do that. Well, I did it indirectly. So what I said is because I my engine assembly is my constraint, what I'm going to, and it's 20 minutes, well, why don't I try buying two of these units? That way I can effectively reduce my, if I have two of these, then my effective cycle time here is, I'm getting one unit here every 10 minutes. So I've reduced my cycle time to 10 minutes. So effectively, I just created what I said I wanted to do, do 10, five and 10.
So the question here is, what is the impact of doing this? Well, if I look on the next slide, here's the original scenario. My line cycle time was 20 minutes. My daily car output was 24 cars per day. By reconfiguring my line in such a way, I've reduced, I've re reduced my, the time of my constraint operation, which is now 10. And now I can produce 48 cars per day. So I just doubled massity. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do before getting into the next segment, because it's uh, one o'clock, let's take a break and then we'll come back and continue on with this particular segment. So we can look at an, a realistic line balancing activity. So what I wrote, what I showed here on the first several slides is just really the concept that we're trying to get to. But this is really simplistic. It's not that easy when we get into a real manufacturing process. But we're going to look at the tools in the next segment that will help us deal with all of that. So let's take a break. It is just a little bit after 1, 105. Um, let me give you a nice break right here. Let me jump to the chat line quickly. Um, break. And uh, I'm going to ask you to come back at, um, let me see here. It's 105. Let's call it 125 p.m. So please be back at 125. And I will see you at that time. Enjoy your break. 